Hello everybody, welcome to the final session for today's Discovery Day Online. Today is all about making monsters, where we are looking at how science and art combine to bring together the ancient world and in our final guest case, fantasy worlds. I'm really excited to have Kate Filesheifter join us today. Kate is a 2D, 3D artist working primarily in the entertainment industry, um, doing concept art, illustration, and 3D creature character art. Her passion is creature design, where she uses information from ecology, paleontology, biology, and mythology to create immersive and charismatic fantasy creatures. I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Welcome, Kate. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me. I I love um, I love museums. I love paleontology, uh, and so I'm I'm really happy to be able to chat with you guys and. Uh, I'm uh, different from your other guests in that I don't like uh, that you've had on today and that I don't specialize specifically in doing paleo art, but I, t I love it and I follow it um, <laughs> pretty, pretty loyally. Uh, I have a lot of favorite artists working in that field. Um, and I like to definitely keep up with what is going on in that realm in terms of like what the latest uh, interpretations of fossil creatures are and what the, like the latest uh, discoveries and papers that are put out on them are because um, what I'm here to talk about today primarily and also to demonstrate a little bit is how much uh, that real world information is like plays such an important role in like just the, the fantasy made up stuff uh, something so that cool. made many people may not realize is that like anytime you got to make something that doesn't exist make like a model on a computer or uh, make up like a new fantasy creature uh it is it is still like even if it's going to be on like an alien planet or something still very much rooted in the biological sciences that we have learned from like our our r1 our like one example planet that we have here which is earth <laughs> which just informs everything we know about like how how life works so far until they find like bacteria on mars or whatever it is that they're up to this um, is gonna be really cool i really love i love creature design like for me it's if i wasn't doing paleontology and i had a little bit more art skill i would definitely be doing that so i hope everyone's excited if you have questions for kate make sure you type them in the chat and uh yeah take it away kate Okay, cool. Um, so just to start, because it kind of helps uh, in helps explain like why I'm gonna why I do what I do later. I'll do just a little bit of demonstration of like uh, a little bit of like a show and tell of the the kind of stuff I do, and like how I the why behind that, how I got to there. Um, uh, right now, if you guys can see my screen, this is just like the splash page on my home page to just demonstrate that I do both. 2D and 3D art. Um, my day job primarily is I work as a 3D uh, creature artist at a game studio in Bellevue called ArenaNet. I work on an MMO called the Guild Wars 2, which is a big fantasy uh, um, setting, basically. It's very, very high fantasy, like full of monsters, um, 
dragons, uh, goblinish things, uh, griffins, lava rock monsters, basically but anything, anything that you want to throw in there, it it fits and it is it it can uh, basically encompass whatever you want to put into it. Um, so that is what I do during my day job, and then prior to that, though, I was very heavily 2D focused and still do a lot of 2D work in my um, free time and for uh, freelance art. I, I started primarily doing uh, 2D illustration draw and uh, drawings. Like I would do um, inserts for uh, role-playing game books. Like this is a creature from um, the fifth edition, I believe, of uh, the Dun uh, Dungeons and Dragons monster manual called the Chul. So I would do book illustration designs like that, uh, usually inserts. And I would do, let's see, over here. Uh -uh. Yeah, uh, concept art for, like, say, other uh, freelance indie projects. Usually all very, like, creature design focused. Um, a lot of insert illustrations, primarily doing monster and creature design. That's just always been um, what I've been most passionate about uh, <laughs> since I was very, very little. Don't know exactly why. <clears throat> but um, a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff that I consumed when I was little, really, I think, looking back on it, helped to define my why I kind of like approach things the way I do. Um, the main thing I always watched when I was a kid was basically Animal Planet documentaries and then of course cartoons. So it was live action animal documentaries and cartoons. <laughs> and that is all I pretty much watched. And the things that uh, I was really always like super hyped for <clears throat> were some of these more fantastical specials. Uh, excuse me, a second. Water is good for you. Um, <clears throat> so there, this was basically a big event in my house. <coughs> um, uh, any of these specials that like Discovery Channel or Animal Planet had, where they were basically combining a lot of the things that I had uh, observed in like nature documentaries with more fantasy, like spec bio type uh, properties. Um, I was super obsessed with this show when that was, this was coming out, which was one of like the first things I had basically seen on how to potentially design somewhat realistic dragons from uh, inspired from different mythological sources. Uh, there was the show that was like what might animals evolve to or look like, like thousands and then poten and millions of years in the future, skipping forward like to different time periods. Uh, and then, like, what might animals on different planets look, planets look like? Um, Alien Planet was a show that came out on the Discovery Channel that was inspired pretty much, like, it was pretty much like a one-to-one -one adaptation of a book by a sci-fi creature artist, Wayne Barlow, who is still working today, as far as I'm aware, doing lots of um, designs for movies. <coughs> and uh, this is, like, one of the paintings from his books. And this is one of the creatures that later appeared in the show. So I was super inspired by this translation and mixture of art and like biological science to come up with new animals, essentially. I, I didn't really divvy up monsters and creatures and aliens. They, they were all just kind of like fantasy animals in my head. And uh, uh, eventually, like I was always just doing 2D illustration primarily. Um, my uh, uh, my mother was a photographer, and she had access to Photoshop, which is one of the most common programs that you'll use for that you'll see artists using for digital painting today. So I was able to get started on that early, and uh, later I basically figured out that um, while I was playing video games, that there are people who have to design these things that go into games and like say movies like Star Wars. <laughs> they don't just like 
exist in a vacuum. Like an, a, a person has to work on it and has to come up with it and design these things. And that's kind of what set me on the traje trajectory that uh, would propel me towards focusing on art as a career. So, uh, the other the other main influence, aside from like obviously uh, specials like this, games would be uh, books. Just being obsessed with, especially fantasy, uh, sci-fi, um, encyclopedias, <laughs> uh, the wildlife of Star Wars, which was illustrated primarily by Terrell Whitlatch um, and written by uh, Bob Caro. Uh, this Arthur Sp uh, Spiderwick's field guide. It was primarily illustrated by uh, Tony D. Terlizzi. Uh, and some of these, like, uh, dragon books that I would find in the bookstore, um, such with these, like, beautiful, naturalistic, very realistic illustrations by uh, Cerullo Cabral. And again, like, another faux encyclopedia, uh, the Dragonology book, illustrated by a bunch of different artists, as seen here. So all these, like, things that if you like, can imagine this page are thinking about the history of the creature, um, how it might have lived, where it came from, what its bodily anatomical adaptations to like surviving in its environment were. Uh, really, really hooked me. I was just like fascinated with thinking about how a uh, and this goes for real animals too, how what something looks like tells a story. How um, everything that like you include in the design can be essentially a plot point or something to communicate to the viewer that uh, this is how this character or creature is going to behave. This is what their personality is like. This is where they live. Uh, basically, the idea of a, a, a single design should kind of carry a story with it. And even if you present it on like a blank page, it should like be evident from looking at it that it's not something that exists in isolation. It's, it's connected to a setting and a place and like a lifestyle. And what it does is like displayed in its features. And just being able to think in depth about that, about, um, how you can communicate to the audience with your design choices, like with a line that you put there or with like traits that you draw on something, um, was just really, uh, has always just really appealed to me and it's just really struck a chord uh, with me. Um, and it's something that I, I try and take, I, I can't really quite help it. I just end up thinking about it for whatever I work on, work on even if it's say, uh, work for like a video game where it's something that's a little bit more fantastical uh, like I don't know sharks that swim through sand instead of swim through the ocean it's they, their purpose in the game is they're just going to attack players who are wandering over sand dunes and whatnot but I'm thinking about like why might it have these these certain lines flowing through its body Maybe to help it swim through the sand and to guide the sand past its face. Or uh, why does it have like this, this hard kind of scalloped structure on here? Maybe so that when it, it wiggles, it can just shift itself under the sand by displacing that more easily. Uh, and then the, the overall streamlined shape. Um, even if like, it's just a, a silly kind of like nonsense thing. Um, you still... It really helps, especially when you don't have a lot of, uh, say, concept support or design guidance otherwise to help, like, uh, box yourself in and help develop, like, plot points for yourself, especially if you're starting out from blue sky and you need to figure out, okay, what am I going to make? Uh, just thinking about where it's going to be placed in, in this case, in a game setting and what, say, the game designers need it to do. That's kind of like its niche in an environment. Um, its role in ecology and then that can get you thinking about like what are real world creatures that are kind of similar to this what uh what would they do in this kind of situation and you can find like in the case of this guy there's lots of different kinds of say 
uh, reptiles primarily that are, are good at burrowing through the sand or sliding through the sand. And so you can look at those for reference or uh, in the case of like equating kind of sand to water, looking at other things, say, maybe that kind of burrow themselves in at the shore, like uh, horseshoe crabs also came up, I think, at one point in time working on these guys. But this is just one example to kind of get the point across that even in something that is super fantastical, that doesn't seem all that really connected to reality, uh, it it's still like basically filtered through the human experience of the real world. We can't help but comparing anything that we see uh, to real life because that's basically where we get our, our sense of like, does this look correct from? Uh, you'll notice very, very quickly if you have a, uh, a human character that looks like off or kind of weird being rendered in 3D because we're even more sensitive to uh, our, our fellow humans. We, we reach, we find that uncanny valley a whole lot quicker. But you'll find it there too for like animal anatomy um, and what makes like a believable flying thing to our eyes. Even if physics says it wasn't, it would never actually work. You can put enough into a design that it can like fool our eyeballs. Um, because our eyes don't know physics. <laughs> our eyes just know what feels right to them. Um, and here's like, say, a few other examples from some personal art where like, I just can sometimes fun, fun to just do a little design, like predator prey exercise of combining like, say, different traits from uh, real world animals, maybe that live in kind of similar environments. Uh, usually if patterns are persisting in a location it's because they provide like a consistent benefit to animals that live there uh so in this case this guy is like inspired by a mix of like a prairie chicken and a serval cat um and then like for this guy who's like almost uh, a little bit more like a realistic in a way than other things He's inspired by, say, a, a frogmouth nightjar birds and these little tiny uh, neuronathid pterosaurs and just kind of mixing and matching traits from those to make something that has kind of like a new aesthetic to it. And then hopefully like trying to uh, learn from the different wing structures of pterosaurs and bats to make something that feels like you could buy that flying around and moving around in an environment because it has these traits to it that tells you kind of like, oh, it's got some camouflage pattern to it. It's probably a bit stealthy in the way that it moves around. It's got a few bright aspects to it. Um, it probably use that, uses those for uh, signaling or for like communication or showing off to members of their own species. Like, one thing you'll kind of pick up again and again from studying real world animals is that uh, usually if there's something kind of flashy on it, it's usually something to do with communication or showing off to uh, other members within the species. And that can be like a fun way to just add little pops and flares of color to things that otherwise might seem like they'd be a detriment. But as long as it like serves some survival purpose, like a, like reproduction or communication, um, you do like get even things like that showing up in nature. Uh, and let's see what I'll be demonstrating uh, today is just an example of kind of like designing something like this. Um, when I'm doing my 3D work, uh, I believe one of our previous artists mentioned working in a program like ZBrush. That is primarily what I do my sculpting in for uh, my my uh, game art that I make for ArenaNet. And I'll usually, uh, if I, depending on like how much I know of what I'm doing, do I have a concept that has already been provided to me? Um, do I just have like a verbal prompt and everything else remains to be figured, needs to be figured out um, by myself? I'll either start sculpting like straight away, say if I already have like a concept, 
or if say like I'm making something that's a real animal like if they say make a horse I can just find lots of reference photos of horses um, but if I don't have a concept and it's going to be a fantasy creature I usually start out with like a rough sketch uh, just because sketching and drawing is where I started out and it's always just kind of naturally quicker for me to explore like big shapes really quickly uh, until you get to something that you're more or less like yeah, that's that's the that's the direction I want to go in. Like if I was going to hand this off to another artist to work on it, I would refine it more and uh, clarify like some of these kind of like things, like what's happening with the feet or what exactly is this body texture, and maybe refine the proportions a little bit. Uh, but since I'm the one who's going to be taking this to 3D, I can translate it myself and and figure that out as I'm rotating it in 3D space and then seeing what what does and doesn't work from this 2D version. And then changing it, as you see, once you get to the final 3D thing. No concept is going to like 100% survive the translation from 2D to 3D, because there's always going to... Uh, you, you get better at it over time, of course, but there's always going to be um, some things that you didn't necessarily anticipate about uh, how something looks once you start to view it from different angles. And uh, the trick with 3D is you tend to are always trying to make stuff look good from as many angles as possible. Whereas in a 2D illustration, I just need to make sure that this looks good from the uh, the perspective I'm presenting it to the viewer. Um, so I think that is it for now. So what I'm going to do for this little demo, if anybody has any questions about that, not, I'll move on. But I'm going to demo a, a creature design kind of based on what I've been talking about. Awesome. I'm really excited to see that. And again, for anyone at home, if you have any questions for Kate, please type them in the chat. And actually, Kate, as you get set up, I have a, I have a question for you. Because like, you said something really cool that I really loved while you were talking um, about how, you know, your the creatures tell a story, right? Like, um, when you have to, when you look at it, it's, there's a story to all the different bits and pieces of it. And, you know, just like in real life, you know, as paleontologists, mm -hmm. all the different adaptations and things like that, they have a story to tell. And for you as a, as a creature designer, um, was that something that was difficult for you to learn? Or is that something that you, you just have, that you kind of, kind of understood to start with? I think because I grew up, as an animal nerd, um, I, I think I had like a bit of a, a head start there and that I had kind of had like this sense that like the way something looks or like the features that it has serves a purpose and is used in this, this animal's life. I kind of had that, uh, that notion that there were utilitarian reasons for why things look the way they did kind of uh, impressed into my mind early on. Um, but I am still always learning new things. Like there's an absurd amount of species in the world and I'm, all, I, I'm, <laughs> I can, I can look on the internet at animals and on like, a, a, a science websites or biology websites and like, um, or, or pages that just share stuff and I can still come across like things I haven't seen before. Um, so, and, and like, uh, new ways uh, as also as as scientists are like studying, say, biomechanics of animals, there's been more studies lately of uh, a lot of the uh, biomechanic, like how things move in all in almost in a way like connected to paleontology in order to uh, better understand and maybe and past apply that to like, OK, based on this thing that's currently living, how would this extinct thing maybe have moved? So there's new information coming out all the time, even about like relatively say mundane animals that are revealing like uh new po new possibilities for like how their their traits may have evolved and how they can be used um so there's al always like new stuff uh new stuff to learn and it's it's fun because every time i get it i'm like ooh, i can put this in my toolbox <laughs> and i might use that later for something it gives me an idea for <laughs> for something fun to try out later uh and i try and treat of it treat it like that like not as like uh, hard and fast rules, like everything 
everything has to be like super scientifically plausible all the time because if I did that then all my dragon designs would just be pterosaurs or eagles <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I use it uh, to help generate ideas is is what I like to think of it as and like how strictly realistic versus fantastic or you'll make something will depend on your purposes of like who's this who's this for um if is it for a cartoony property is it for more something that would be like a live action property that'll kind of dictate how uh outlandish versus believable it needs to be yeah i will say as you get set up um i was really excited kind of seeing your your board with all the stuff you had on there because I, you know, I, I love Mass Effect, you know, all the books that you showed are things that I love. And I do that subconsciously is when I'm seeing a new creature. I always want to figure out like, you know, for myself as a paleontologist who, you know, I st we study evolution. I like to kind of, even though they don't tell it, I like to tell the story in my head. Like, um, like, I don't know how you feel about Thresher Maws in Mass Effect, but uh, I, I, I am very fascinated about like how those things evolved and adapted on you know the planet of the krogans on tichanka which is this harsh planet but this huge worm creature somehow evolved i mean obviously sandworms is a very common trope in science fiction. yeah everybody loves it, giant sandworms <laughs> <laughs> but it's just, it's just so cool and even like seeing the different species and mass effect right there mm -hmm. there was some thought in the evolution and biology of them um in like the turians how they have yeah. their exoskeletons and you know that's that's what i love of creature design and you know getting to learn about that and seeing folks like you who put the real thought in science is just so exciting for me yeah th thank you yeah i uh yeah i love um as well the the designs of the of the original like aliens and mass effect you could see they had like a different goal and kind of a story they were trying to tell uh and a theme they were trying to hit up with each one of them um and uh yeah, that's an, an example of like uh, thinking about your your design choices and how those kind of influence your storytelling. Like the the Salarians are basically their equivalent gray race. They're like they're they're kind of like classic bug-eyed, uh, a little bit diminut diminutive uh, alien people. But they kind of try <laughs> and explain it by like having them be kind of amphibian based, and it then makes like a lot of some of their like kind of physical traits kind of make more sense and kind of uh, kind of mesh together better because they kind of have that base that's kind of holding everything in place. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're going to do a demonstration, you said, right? Yeah, I'll go to, to okay. do a, a little walkthrough, like um, designing a creature. I'm probably going not going to get far enough ahead to go into uh, 3D, but I'll be doing like a, the 2D sketch and painting. Um, and I'm going to talk about, like, my, my journey through how I, I gather that reference for it. Fantastic. And if there's any questions, I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people can feel free to ask stuff as it comes up while um, I'm drawing. So just to start off, I was, um, I was reading something in a, a book about um, different uh, dragons throughout uh different folklores and mythologies um, and that's always been one of the things that I just do all the time like if I have no other ideas in my head I'll, I'll draw like a fantasy dr dragon <laughs> um, and one of the fun things that I like about them is they uh, we tend to have like maybe a stereotypical image in our head nowadays that's kind of been cemented by and kind of formed by D&D &D and things like Lord of the Rings as to what they look like um, the classic like uh, six limbed dragon and by six limbs I mean you know your two front legs your two hind legs and your two wings um, is it's probably the prominent one we think of when we think of like European dragons but going back into uh, mythology and in this book I was reading it reminded me of some of the weirder ones that they also have which uh, can like have all kinds of body shapes and forms and stuff to them. They they look like crazy. There's no real strict rule as to 
how many limbs they have, if they have wings, if they don't have wings, if they breathe fire, if they breathe like noxious poison gas, uh, if they got like chicken heads or <laughs> uh, uh, s- spike spurs on their tails. Um, the, the sky is basically the limit. Um, so I'm going to pick one of the like seemingly kind of simple ones, but also kind of weird in a way, uh, a, which is the Lindorm or Lindworm or Lindworm, uh, many different spellings for this, but it is, again, you'll see a lot of different interpretations for how this is illustrated, but, uh, more or less it's like a serpentine thing with usually just a single pair of limbs. It could either be like front limbs, like this one that's accosting this uh, Swiss woodworker from 1723, or it could be uh, almost looking almost a little bit more like theropod dinosaur hind limbs. And sometimes they got wings, sometimes they don't. Usually it might be something kind of like this. So one of the weird things I think about this is that When you go back, uh, a lot of really early European dragons, it kind of becomes obvious when you read about people's descriptions of them, because these people were writing as if it was like a real animal. They thought, they believed that it was a real animal at a certain point in time. Um, It becomes, you kind of pick up that there's a lot of synonyms with just, uh, with snakes, with venomous snakes specifically. So a lot of them were a lot were a lot more snake like when you get further back in the mythology and then they slowly start to become a little bit more fantastical and they start to sprout limbs um and wings and all kinds of other features and one of my the funniest things i always think about this guy is uh <clears throat> there's at, at one point a description of like a lind worm as a Uh, a serpent basically that can outrun a man on horseback which is a very weird thing if you think of it a snake outrunning a man (laughs) on horseback so i'm going to design one that's kind of based off of like this this uh speedy uh serpent of arabia uh some kind of like desert dwelling road runner type creature um and then where I might start with that is, well, the first thing I kind of think of is theropod dinosaurs. So <clears throat> as I was starting to develop this board, um, first thing I grabbed just as a refresher was uh, some skeletals of some different theropods. Um, also some skeletals of some similar kind of birds, like uh, if it doesn't have front limbs, I was kind of thinking of the moa, these giant New Zealand extinct uh, ratites that had just completely, or one of the few animals that kind of just, if I remember correctly, just completely lost their their wings entirely. They don't really even have like their front arms, arm bones, like still in their body anymore, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then seeing how I can maybe combine that with some of their ancient ancestors, the theropod dinosaurs and I was just thinking about weird ways that people might interpret a bird without their feathers I was thinking of this illustration of all yesterdays of like what if we found the skeleton of a swan and it was a thousand years in the future and we didn't know what a swan looked like anymore and it might get pretty serpentine with the crazy neck and stuff like almost thinking of how we used to kind of shrink wrap dinosaurs when interpreting them and then applying that to a swan and thinking about like what kind of crazy stuff you can get. And thinking about how like if I think about a bird that way, how might that kind of influence like my design for this thing? So lots of anatomical reference, uh, primarily because it's gonna have these big, strong legs. And I want to get that uh anatomy right. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why my throat is so scratchy today. Um, and this work from like uh, these other paleontologists who are also artists themselves is super, super useful. <coughs> Gosh. Um, 
so yeah, this this kind of stuff becomes like a treasure mine when you when you get a paleontologist who also draws for someone like me. I'll just look at this stuff all day. <coughs> And then that actually leads into my real life animal reference, which I like start from things like the swans that have serpentine necks. I'm thinking about how it might attack, maybe shooting its uh, venomous fangs out in front of itself after coiling up its neck a bit like a heron or a bit like a snake. And then that leads me to like animals that I remember from my exposure of just looking around online from watching nature documentaries whatever comes to mind uh right really fast uh birds that are more or less shaped like this creature might be would be like emu and ostriches and looking at reference for their very dinosaur-like feet gives me a lot of ideas and then obviously you have some snakes for the mouth structure uh for f uh, facial structure ideas maybe how to do the scales maybe even like i am uh, some of these markings, these stripes, could be cool to implement as well. And might maybe get a little bit more lizardy. Who knows? It's it's a dragon, so it doesn't have to be strictly only influenced by a snake. So this is something that I'll keep off to the side while I'm working. I will usually, while I'm drawing, be panning around and going to uh, whatever is relevant to whatever I'm looking at uh, to start off with. So for now, I'm kind of thinking of this being a fast running creature. I might kind of just leave it looking at these emus over here for a bit. And here we go, the most exciting art the blank page. Oh, let me get something else up first. This is just a quick idea that I did the night before as well. Just to think about, like, get, like, uh, some rough ideas out of my head to start. Uh, I was thinking that since uh, a lot of these dragons have, are very, have very varying amounts of how many, how many limbs do they have, uh, maybe this creature is related to them. Maybe it actually like lost and is in the process of losing its front limbs, kind of like the the moa eventually did, or uh, kind of like looking at like a Carnotaurus, kind of like how they almost look like they're going to just lose their forearms one day, and it's barely even doing anything for them at this point. So that was just a quick idea to get out of my head from the start might not actually be what the final thing ends up looking like. So I'll usually like to start with just something that's kind of loose that I can uh, change and not and like draw over again later once I figure something out, uh, figure out like the general direction that I'm going to go for. And what I really want to get convey with this creature is like a sense of energy in its movement. And I'm kind of thinking of like some of these crazy positions that uh, uh, these emu get themselves into. And I usually start off something with something like a gesture. It's just almost like a bunch of hairy lines, a bunch of swirls. I usually always end up drawing something too big and then shrinking it down later so I can fit the thing in the whole frame. I like using long bodies especially. Long serpentine things are always fun because you can get a lot of dynamic shapes with them. You can do a lot of swirls and then straight lines that have a lot of energy to them swirls kind of catch your eye up and causes it to slow down and the straight lines kind of tell your mind what to scan over more quickly uh, so you don't end up uh, getting caught on less important details. Now a long tail like this 
isn't necessarily a great thing for uh, aerodynamics. It's like a lot of, especially if it's loose, it's a lot of weight to have dangling behind you. But I'm going to make a creative decision here and have dynamic purpose. It's one of those choices that I would make based on this being a fantasy creature uh, that may not necessarily need the uh, like hold up alongside like say a live action lion on the savannah. The other big feature guy is going to have his main anatomical trait going to be his big powerful legs for running. I I don't know if you ever looked at emus when they are getting very excited about something they've seen on the ground. Um, or like a like a cat toy or a ferret ball and they are investigating it and freaking out over it and kind of <laughs> jumping and flailing all around. Uh, I can't tell if they're happy or if they're afraid exactly, but it is pretty impressive the heights that they can get up to and also uh, how uh, high those big clawed limbs can get in the air. <laughs> kind of a goofy creature, but not something that you necessarily want to mess with. So one thing I'll think about for something like this is this guy is a predator. And you got to think, okay, you have uh, two problems that you have to solve. You have to catch uh, your prey, and then you have to uh, kill your prey. Um, another problem for the snake is you have to <laughs> then eat your prey, which is a whole other ordeal. Um, but for example, think of like a golden eagle. It uses its claws, its talons, uh, and its weight plummeting out of the sky to, say, um, do the, the, the capture and the restraint. Uh, but then it uses its giant beak to do the actual eating part. Though its beak itself looks very dangerous and deadly, uh, the beak is just like its fork that it's using it to break into stuff, but it is mainly using um, its powerful claws to do the, the dispatching. So for this creature, I'm kind of thinking of something a little bit of the opposite. If it is kind of venomous, a, a, a big a thing that even if like all, even if all like medieval dragons don't necessarily breathe fire, they all kind of tend to have some kind of like, uh, some kind of like breath attack. It's kind of stems from uh, uh, medieval people being inspired by venomous serpents and equating like venom with a fiery sensation, and it, you can kind of see how that then leads into the fire breath thing. Uh, but a lot of people also just uh, believed that um, this meant that some of these snakes could just exude and like breathe out the venom. They're not they're noxious uh, noxious vapors and breath itself. So you'll actually find a lot of medieval dragons as having like uh, venom breath or like poison breath because of that. So this guy is going to be similar in that he maybe he's like has some aspects of a spinning cobra and he's going to have some venom. And that'll be what he's going to use to do his attacking. And I think he'll probably use his feet to do the the breaking up of, of the food to eat. Uh, we have a question, Kate, for yeah. you. So this is from The Real Andrew Martin. Uh, they're asking, do you usually go into your concepts, illustrations, already having an idea of what you want to create? I see a lot of artists creating very scribbly thumbnails until something looks good. I do a bit of both. Like, if I... Uh... If I had a little bit more time, I would be doing more thumbnails here. I'd be doing like more more things like this that were just a little bit loose. 
like trying to get the sense of what the shape is going to be. Um, but if I find also like a good idea that I like straight away, uh, I'll start moving into that too. I don't, I don't necessarily think that you need to, and again, it'll, it'll depend on your purpose. Like I'm just concepting kind of for myself right now. Um, I don't necessarily think you need to make like, like a hundred thumbnails of a thing or like 50 of a thing. I would just like make, uh, I'd make like a, uh, a few good ones, like maybe like five five ones that you really like, and I tend to think that that is usually enough to start off with, um, because especially if you're going to be then um, making something and showing that to someone else for approval, uh, you're going to come back and do a whole bunch of more drawings anyway at that point. Because they'll uh, they'll like see something that they can then latch on for that first phase. You're just trying to get show them something that they can then latch on to, and they can start to envision like their prompt as a visual thing. So I would just give them a few ones that you really look that you're really yourself like something that you would be excited to work on uh, to start off with, rather than like overloading them with too much to choose from. Well, Jared McGowan um, in our chat thinks this is the design looks really, really good so far, and we're excited to see how it turns out. Oh, thanks. I yeah, a lot of fun with this stuff. I'm, I'm wondering. Let's see. Can I bring this over top? Uh, forgetting how to use pure refs controls for a second. Um, I'm wondering too if I should stretch this pubis out more and give more uh, mass behind the tail. So that's what I'm experimenting with right now. Um, and like, oh, like I said, I have this thing where I'll usually, as I get into it, I'll realize, oh, I should, should shrink this down and pull this out more. I really kind of like uh kind of like the awkwardness of the body continuing past uh the tail more. Just really helping to lengthen out the body and kind of keep almost like some of that serpentine aspect to it. Anything that can help it feel longer. Uh -huh. oh. There we go. That's something selected. So let's see if this leg here is going to be powerful enough for both running and for uh, tearing food up. I kind of want it to have some nice fatty joints to it. You can see ligaments in. And let's see, I like uh, also the idea, since this guy doesn't have limbs that he can, like front arms, that he can really make use of. I like maybe him having some kind of ability to restrain his prey. Uh, and I'm just a, a sucker, really, for uh, those, those switchblade claws on... Uh, <laughs> Dromaeosaur raptors. It's a classic. Yeah, it's just always fun. Uh, it, it, you could, it, you could also make like a few maybe a little bit similarities, parallels to uh, say roosters. They have those dagger-like spurs on the back of their legs. Just 
like kicking, like or like cowboy spurs. Just leg weapons are fun. <laughs> I'm going to give him. I think. Just checking to see, like the fattier toe on the ostrich is kind of on the inside, and they have the strut stabilizing on the outside. Um, funny thing you'll notice is that running adapted animals, when like all they're using their feet for is running, they tend to lose digits and then just broaden up out the ones that they have. Something to do, if I recall correctly, with them, um, just having less less weight, uh, swinging around on that leg and it probably helps with stability in a way too even though cheetahs are super fast um, they keep those extra digits and extra claws uh, because they, they need to hold on and grab stuff claws of course are also really great for traction but if they were not needing to attack anything their feet might end up having been evolving differently. It's an interesting thing to think about. And I think there's like always a lot of expression that you can do. Like <laughs> feet, feet are very expressive in a way, and that uh, it's it's like a tool. But like you think of our hands. Think of how much ex uh, like emotion you can get in your hands like when you twist them up and you make like witch fingers out of them or you point at someone menacingly uh, the way it, it, since it's like a limb that, every, that everything kind of uses to um, interact very personally with the world and to really explore their environment uh, digits can have a lot of character to them I want this to have more of something more of a kink in it. Maybe a little bit higher up on the body. I'm trying to get some foreshortening in here. Trying to get this a little bit less so, so it's a little bit less in profile. Still grabbing that. A little bit less in profile, and a little bit more uh, coming forward into space. Um, so, so uh, in the chat, they're asking, what software is this? Uh, because it appears like it has a lot of functionality with like the brushes and the, the, um, the cropping and the modifications that you're doing. Yes, this is... Um... Like I mentioned earlier, this is a um, Adobe Photoshop, um, and there's lots of programs that you can use to do digital painting. And nowadays, um, this is just the one that I've always I've, I'm the most used to myself. It's got it's got a lot of features. It's primarily started out as something for uh, editing photography, and uh, that is that is why I grew up having access to it because my mother was a photographer already had a copy in the house <laughs> um, but there are like programs that are uh, that are available on say like um, like app based programs today like procreate is a really good one oh, my walk and tablet needs to be awakened uh, Corel painter is something people use um, I know there are there are there are plenty of others out there, and you'll see a lot of people using Photoshop. Um, but it is it is not like really in this case the software so much as so much as yourself. So I would use whichever whichever you're comfortable with, whichever you can have get access to. Trying to think of where is his rib cage in here? Like that. Look at um, 
these uh, muscle diagrams by Matt Dempsey, another paleontologist and artist, are really helpful, especially anytime you can get odd views like the underside. Usually, a lot of times you'll just find uh, profile views, but these top and bottom views are really handy. Trying to get this lateral line of all this thick muscle in the tail. Get a sense of how it's turning in space. This is kind of a little bit getting a more lizardy towards the end here. Uh, a little bit more serpentine as it goes down the length. The theropods themselves wouldn't have this much flexibility in the tail. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Want to raise this up even more. Make him even longer. And I kind of like the idea of when you look at um, uh, herons and they're getting into their strike pose, the neck kind of uh, smooths into the silhouette of the body a lot of the time. And it's kind of helped by these long kind of stringy or feathers that they have that helps to uh, kind of smooth out and buffer out that transition from the chest to the neck. So... I was thinking of playing around with something like that, except saying that it is like long, spiny scales, maybe something like an iguana might have. And, uh, you know, anything that's like in the dragon family needs lots of spikes. Lots of spiny protuberances that you don't want to touch. You can kind of use that to buff out that silhouette there. Almost like, you could almost, almost think of that as like porcupine quills too. Strangely, there's like, <laughs> I did find some medieval art of a, of a, basically a porcupine dragon. <laughs> there's, they did, they did everything. You, a dragon could be like whatever you want it to be when it comes to European dragons. I love looking at some of those medieval art and like what, or even like what they thought like, rhinos and all these other weird creatures that they were drawing it's just so fun to see how their interpretation of them based on just verbal descriptions is so fun to look at yeah i really i find that really interesting because it's like you can see how stories are formed and how mythology can develop from just like um almost like uh telephone games like if anyone's mm -hmm. ever played like uh those kind of there, there's like kind of like equivalent games that you can play with your friends where one person starts drawing something or describing something and another person has to finish it. <laughs> um, and you can w wind up with something that's like wildly different from what you anticipated or what you were going for when you first started off the drawing as it goes through a cycle of more people. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of think of uh, um, the explorers coming back with tales of creatures from foreign far off exotic countries and, and like trying to describe them to people as something kind of similar and you can see examples of that uh for all kinds of cultures not just just for european explorers but uh for um, people who are going on voyages and coming back to uh like China or Japan and like giving their accounts of like giraffes and things getting all kinds of weird stuff or like lions uh, you get a lot of like weird interpretations of, of lions that uh, that basically become new 
mythological creatures themselves. With like a she she like guardian statues. Let's see. I've been neglecting his face because I've been having too much fun with his his uh, long tail and body. <laughs> I think the question now is what is its armor class rating? I'm just kidding. <laughs> gosh did i do a stupid thing did the most mediocre of mistakes that i was drawing on the background layer <laughs> <Don't>, oh no <laughs> doesn't matter i have a way for fixing it way to fix this later like while it's white it's actually not that big of a problem um Right, so, sorry, could you repeat your last question again? I'm not. Did I answer it? Or not? Oh, no, I was just making a joke of what what would its armor class be because it's yes. looking real D and D now. <laughs> yes, what would its armor class be? So I think because this guy kind of feels a bit glass cannon y to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what with like, he'll probably have like super deadly venom breath. He'll be super speedy. He will he will hit for a lot, um, but because he's he's got to be balanced right he, he uh he comp he trades off um some of that uh speed and some of that damage dealing um probably not being able to take as many hits himself if you can manage to land a hit because he's just <laughs> running around everywhere zigzagging and like flopping and weird weird like <laughs> unanticipated directions again look at I, look at emu, emus running around <laughs> i like it i'm gonna be dming in a in a few in maybe next month or so so i might be i might be borrowing this <laughs> yeah yeah um, tell me how, so it, tell me how it goes <laughs> we'll do we're unfortunately almost out of time in a few minutes so while you finish up i have um one more question for you that you can answer that we usually ask our guests is, you know, what piece of advice would you give to somebody who, who might be interested in going into creature design? Mm, my, I, let's see, I hope it's not like uh, cliche. My advice is to always like uh, study, study from life as much as possible um, and study uh, variety, a variety of different animal anatomy as much as possible. Um, your design uh, range will be very much influenced by what you uh, what you expose yourself to and what you draw. Um, and you'll you'll find Sammy a lot of people who who only do like uh, vertebrates or like only do reptiles. And stuff. And just try and think of like uh, like looking at looking at weird things. Look at like look at microbiology and like what weird form stuff gets under the microscope. Or look at like deep sea creatures. Or look at invertebrates or like like small animals and not just the big like charismatic ones. Just because you can find all kinds of weird ideas and like uh, forms in there that say like maybe other people have been overlooking and not using as much. And then, then yeah, just study, study from life. The more you draw um, from real creatures, the more uh, you'll kind of just naturally get these forms stuck in your head, a bit like riding a bike. Um, and the the faster you'll be able to just kind of like, uh, you'll you'll always be coming back to reference. Like, <laughs> I, I, I like, I never don't. End, I always end up accumulating reference because you're just gonna naturally like develop more ideas and um you're gonna get more specific as you start like finishing a drawing or a painting um but you'll uh it'll it'll get faster your idea generation the more like different possibilities of like what something like that you expose yourself to just getting the the natural flow for how uh for how muscles are generally laid out on most animals just naturally um stuck in your head it's just like something that's just kind of in your mental library that you can just pull out um, and then even being a creature designer like humans are creatures too so don't neglect 
human anatomy, a lot of creature design will still be like modified humans, like think werewolves or vampires or zombies and, and that kind of thing. Uh, humans are animals too, and so you'll probably end up um, making good use of mixing and matching human anatomy with other creatures. Oh, that's really great it can advice. Really also, yeah, it can really also help you understand and relate to the animal forms too. Once you see that, like this muscle, um, maybe like <clears throat> on the back of this leg here, like the gastrocnemius, is is the same muscle on the back of our legs, and uh, it'll help you kind of like remember them better once you kind of are unable to understand how it relates to your own body. It's a lot of it is all the same bones and the same muscles, and just kind of warped and stretched in different ways awesome i would love to see someone create a cool creature based on a tardigrade that would be fun i think <clears throat> that would be amazing i would love that oh like a <laughs> giant giant <laughs> yeah something like something giant that you know maybe lives on a water world or might even be like something that exists in space as a silicon based creature i don't know yeah. Um, but yeah, um, as we're coming up near the end, and we're going to, I really want to see the end of this, so I'm going to push it as much as we can. Um, but I want to say thank you so much to everybody for joining us. Um, all of Kate's information and uh, social media and websites are in the description below. And for us at the ALF Museum, if you love Discovery Day Online and want to support more programs like it, um, you can find ways to do that and donate to the museum in the description below as well. Um, so yeah, let's we're gonna let Kate finish off this really really cool creature because I'm definitely gonna be using it in a, <laughs> in a future campaign. I'm gonna force all my players to fight this high dexterity glass cannon. I would assume. Yes, that sounds about right to me. I will. Yeah, tell me how it goes. Venom, <laughs> venom, venom bite. Zoom in around. Don't get hit by him. <clears throat> but yeah, I'll, I'll scribble up this for as, as long as you like. Probably spread that tongue out more. And uh, yeah, thank you again so much for inviting me. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> no, this was great. This was such a really fun thing to watch watch the design in process and uh you know just kind of show folks how we can really take inspiration from the amazing world around us because evolution has come up with some crazy experiments through the millions of years of life history that we can take to create these fantasy worlds that are grounded in reality but exist within our imagination yeah nature is always stranger than fiction everybody tries to outdo it all the time but then you go and like look at anything on the internet like wow <laughs> that's already a fantasy creature <laughs> <laughs> all right it looks like we're gonna have to wrap it up here so let me pull back and uh if, if you want you want to show the final or how where we're at so far yeah sure he's probably gonna have some spikes and stuff coming off but this is this squiggly legged horror beast so far <laughs> <laughs> that looks so cool. I can see it like I can see the running motion that it's doing and kind of its head being locked in place as it's running because it's locked onto its prey. That would be so cool. Yes, it's just gonna and then sling. The next thing is I'll have to draw a version where its neck is slung all the way out <laughs> as it's shooting forward. <laughs> I hope you can put that on your social media. That'd be really cool to see. Yeah, when it when I, yeah once it's finished up probably make some changes awesome all right well that about does it for discovery day online thank you all so much for joining us today um it's been real fun learning about how science and art combine to bring the uh, worlds of the past and fiction to life um as always like i said if you want to support programs like this you can find them in the description below and make sure you like and subscribe to the alf museum for more stories from the world of paleontology Thank you all so much, and we hopefully will see you all next month for our Power of Plants Discovery Day, where we're going to look at how amazing and cool plants are through all of, ge all of geologic time and kind of how we exist with them today. 
thanks everybody and we'll see you next month yeah